Dr. Mazzoli, thank you for what you do and thanks for spending some time with us today. Well, thank you for having us. We appreciate it so much. You know, for so long we heard about the potential for a shortage of ventilators and people were very concerned about that across the country. Now you go on the internet or pick up the paper and you're starting to hear about a shortage of people who know how to work those ventilators, respiratory therapists. So my first question is, are you seeing a shortage at the university level? Are you seeing fewer people interested in the field? You know, actually, we, um, we are seeing fewer inter people interested in the field, um, and that's only been a recent trend. But we expect now with the, the people that are, are giving us some attention that know that we're frontline, we expect that to change. So, um, yes, we're still looking for qualified folks to, to become respiratory therapists, and there's plenty of opportunity. There always, quite frankly, has been plenty of opportunity. So we at Augusta University and the College of Allied Health produce some of the best. It seems like a high-stress job, not just during a pandemic, but anytime you're trying to help someone breathe, it seems that way. Is there a lot of anxiety connected to this profession? I wouldn't say anxiety. We have a saying in the profession that says, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. And so that's part and parcel of what we um, educate our, our folks to do. And actually, in my experience, that is when everything comes right, right together. What you've learned about how people breathe and how you can help them breathe. Uh, it's not a stress and anxiety piece, but um, it is one that really gets the adrenaline going. And so... Uh, it really, it really, really is kind of something that uh, has kept me in it for the better part of, well, almost 50 years now. You know, you hear about that, that when everything goes sideways, your training kicks in, and it, it sounds mm -hmm. like that's exactly what happens. That is exactly what happens, Brad. The, the, uh, there's the, the slow times, there are times when you can spend some time with, with patients at the bedside, or if you work in home care, you can, you can take some time in their homes. But when it's an emergency, um, things kick in, and therapists really rush to the opportunity. It's not like, oh, no, I've got to be. That's not the way that it, it is at all. When, when the code call comes, we rush to the opportunity. When we have to go pick up a, a child in one of the outlying hospitals and the respiratory therapist is in the transport team, jump in the helicopter and go. Um, it really is. It's one of those things that, that we are uh, educated to do, trained to do, and love to do. Um, that's part of being at the bedside, and it's part and parcel. And our graduates know that, and our graduates do a great job of that. How long does it take to become a respiratory therapist, and what degree or qualifications do you need to start studying it? The minimum number of, uh, the minimum degree of, for becoming a respiratory therapist is an associate degree. Um, the Commission on Accreditation for Respiratory Care has put a moratorium on those. Uh, it will only be at the baccalaureate degree level for new therapists. Oftentimes for, well, in, in our case, for baccalaureate degrees, there's two years of prerequisite courses that have to be taken, and then there is two years of respiratory therapist courses that have to be taken. Um, Two-year programs, many have prerequisite courses before you get in, um, and then you complete it at the end of their um, curriculum, typically another two years as well. How many years do you have to be in the classroom? Is it, is it two before you can jump over to the clinical side and start practicing on people? Well, you no, know, that's a great question. It varies from program to program. Some programs have an introductory clinic early on. Um, other programs have all of the, the laboratory and classroom front loaded and they go afterwards. We have sort of a hybrid program. We give them a lot of information in the first semester, and then we send them right into the clinic, and then the final semester is all clinic, uh, 40 hours a week for the last 15 weeks of the, of the program. So we kind of we kind of bring it in uh, progressively, and then they're in quite a little bit. You know, during this pandemic, we're seeing those professionals, respiratory therapists, and others work such long hours to the point of exhaustion really is the typical work day when times are normal like that is it is it long and and tiring or is it more like your nine to five thing you know that's a hybrid question too the 
typical therapist works three days a week, 12 hour shifts. That's probably the most common schedule. So it, 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 it's about more balanced lifestyle. Um, it also depends on the area that you work. For example, if you're in research, it's typically not 12 hours. Um, number of RTs go into research. If you're in the pulmonary function lab, it's not. So on a normal day, in a normal circumstance, without the situation that we have now, life work balance is in place. That is the typical work day. So it's not a nine to five, typically 12 hour shift starting 6.30 in the morning until 7.30 at night. But you're, we do the clinics in preparation for that so that the students know how to kind of balance their time and we let them know before they come into the program. So, and the other piece too is that if you're working, for example, some of our students have gone to the Centers for Disease Control. Um, if you're working in a more office setting in, in physicians' offices, then that is a typically a nine to five kind of piece as well. So it's only in times like these where, for example, in New York, people were being called out of retirement to, right. to take care of the situation. Um, that's when the training programs kind of fall short. We just can't, we can't turn them out in two weeks. It's, it's, it's just not there. There's too much physiology. There's too much clinical practice. There's too much technical expertise to run these ventilators, run these life support systems, take care of the, of the patients when they're on there. So that takes time. Well, because of the yeah. pressing need that we're seeing right now, have you had some of your students who are about to graduate, not yet, but they're close, get called up, get called to action? Well, that has been common around the country. Um, that request has not been um, honored here. It's because of the safety that we want to make sure for our students. We know that, that they're perfectly capable at, at this juncture in their education. But um, we have been very cautious uh, with respect to putting them at risk. And that's what we want to make sure of, that we take care of our students and that they are, even though they're ready, that this might not be the best time to put them um, in the situation that COVID-19 typically places people. Dr. Mazzoli, just a couple more questions. First of all, sure. what should we tell our young people who have listened to this interview and who say, hey, I think that's a career for me. What should they study in say middle, high school? Is it all science, all math? We have a heavy emphasis on science and math, but RTs need to be able to communicate. So written English, spoken um, English, um, those kinds of skills are very important. Interpersonal skills are very important. We've had any number of folks who have been in, in the food service industry who know how to wait on, on people. That's important as well. So yeah, science and math is very important. Chemistry is very important. Biology is very important. But really, we're with people 24-7, and those skills are important as well. So when we look at students for admissions, yes, we look at their GPA, but we also look at a rounded person who's willing to, to work with patients who are not always at their best and who are willing to, as I say, go 240 with their hair on fire uh, when the time is needed. So we look for those kind of people. And oh, by the way, we have plenty of people that come into the profession that these are their second careers. So it's not just young people coming out of high school, which was my case, but we have plenty of people that have um, been in business and industry and have come to, to bedside to take care of people. Doctor, you've logged the better part of a half of a century in this field, and I know countless people are grateful to you for that. What have you gotten out of it? I, I will tell you what I get out of it, and I see it all the time. When I go to the hospital, and I see our graduates taking care of people, many, many, many graduates over and over and over again. That's the satisfaction that I get out of being a teacher. It's not the aha moment. It's seeing the graduates in the critical care areas taking care of patients in the neonatal nursery, in home care. That's what I got out of 50 years of being in this profession. And I hope others will take, take up the baton and, and carry it for another 50 years. Dr. Andrew Mazzoli, you are saving and changing lives each and every day. Thank you for everything you do. That's what we do. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Dr. Andrew Mazzoli, Augusta University's Program Director for the Respiratory Therapy Program.